let's talk about Quill Kukla's work on sexual communication and sexual agency. Kukla argues that invitations are one of the crucial discursive tools or tools that we, oh, perform via language for sexual interactions. So we're going to start off by working to understand how invitations work in general. Then we'll look at sexual invitations. Finally, we'll look at why invitations are so important for sexual interactions and sexual agency. Okay, so let's start off. Invitations are a type of speech act. So a speech act is an action that we perform via language. So speech acts can be spoken aloud, they can be performed via sign language, they can be oh, performed via writing, so texting people or messaging people. It's like one of the major ways that we communicate these days. It's about the different kinds of actions that we perform via language. Every kind of speech act has its own distinct structure. So let's look at the structure of invitations. So an invitation is when someone invites another person to do something. Part of the structure of an invitation is that it should be welcoming or encouraging. If I am throwing a dinner party and I go up to someone and say, hey, I'm throwing a dinner party tonight. You can come, I guess, if you want to. That was not really an invitation. I think I gave them an option of attending my dinner party, but they weren't invited. They weren't welcomed to attend my dinner party. Okay, so it needs to be at least somewhat welcoming or encouraging, because part of what an invitation is communicating is that the person would like it if the other person took up the invitation, right? So it's signaling something about the person doing the inviting would actually like it um, if the other person took up the invitation. The other crucial component of invitations as a type of speech act is that they need to genuinely be open for the person receiving the invitation to either take up or decline. So they need to actually be able to either say yes or no to the invitation. So, oh, sometimes we might receive something that sounds like an invitation, but if you can't actually say no to it, it's not really an invitation. So for example, if you're boss were to be throwing a dinner party and to invite you to it, they might write it out on a fancy card that says you are invited. They might hand that card to you and say, here's your invitation. You might say, you are cordially invited to this dinner party, right? So they can, they can say that it's invita an invitation as much as they want to, but because they're your boss and because your job might be at stake if you say no to this, if you decline it, it's not really an invitation. So it doesn't necessarily matter what the surface grammar is or what it sounds like. What actually matters is how this type of speech act works, what it actually is doing. So if someone can't really say yes or no to the invitation, it's not actually an invitation. So put another way, invitations are not simply weak commands. So, oh, for a command, as long as the person issuing the command has the right kind of authority, you actually have to follow the command. So in the context of an academic class, if your professor says, turn in the paper on Friday, you have to turn in the paper on Friday. It's not, it's not really an open choice. Now, you might not turn in the paper on Friday, um, but then you'll have done something wrong and there'll probably be consequences, right? So you violated the command, you did something wrong. But Invitations are not like that. For it to be an invitation, you in fact have to be able to say either yes or no to the invitation. Whew, okay, so that is incredibly crucial. It doesn't matter what the surface grammar sounds like. For it to be an invitation, you need to be able to say yes or no to it. Cool. So when you receive an invitation, you can say, yes, I would love to be there. Great. Or you can say no. If you say no, it's required, or it's appropriate to express some sort of gratitude for the invite. Oh, thanks so much, but I'm working that night, I can't make it, right? It doesn't have to be the most flowery of speeches, but you're generally required to issue some kind of gratitude for receiving the invite. 
if you accept the invitation and then change your mind. It's generally inappropriate to just arbitrarily now uh, back out of the invitation, right? If you say, yes, I'd love to be at your dinner party, it's generally viewed as like rude or inappropriate. If you text like five minutes before and be like, you know what, I just, I'm really feeling like lying in bed and eating pizza, so no, nope, not coming. Uh, now, if you issue like some kind of context or reason, something like, I'm just having a really hard night, I'm not up for socializing, I'm so sorry, then you've done some sort of repair work and things are probably gonna be okay. But generally speaking, you have to issue some kind of reason and make some kind of apology if you back out of an invitation. Of course, people violate some of these norms all the time. But the point is that they're violating norms when they do. They are not properly following the conventions of an invitation. Now, let's talk about sexual invitations. Sexual invitations are very, very similar to the other broader kind of invitation, but as Kukla argues, they are importantly different in a few specific ways. All right, so let's go through sexual invitations. Just like regular invitations, sexual invitations need to be warm or welcoming or inviting. If someone says, hey, do you wanna go back to my place? They are communicating that they would in fact like it if the person being invited would come back to their place, right? If they instead say something like, we could go back to my place or not, like whatever, I don't care if you do or if you don't. Well, that, once again, was maybe laying out options, but it is not in fact an invitation, right? Because it's not communicating anything about the what the inviter would like the other person to do. Now, once again, sexual invitations crucially need to be open for the person receiving the invite to either say yes or no to, to either accept or decline the invitation. Someone says, hey, do you wanna go back to my place? It is imperative, it is essential that the person receiving that invite can either genuinely say yes or no to that invite for it to count, for it to actually be an invitation. And this is especially crucial within the context of sexual invitations because if someone doesn't really have the option of saying no, then that sexual encounter cannot be consensual. In order for it to be a consensual sexual encounter, there must be the possibility of saying no, right? Um, that is, once again, like crucial to what it is for something to be a consensual interaction. Okay, so just as with regular invitations, sexual invitations are warm, welcoming, but crucially, it is open for the person receiving them to either say yes or no to them. If they do say no to the invitation, here's where sexual invitations work a little bit differently from other kinds of invitations. If someone declines the invite, they do not have to express gratitude for the invitation. And this is especially clear if we think about, oh, maybe something like catcalling or street harassment. If somebody is saying, hey baby, wanna come back to my place? To a random stranger on the street, that random stranger does not need to respond with, Oh, thank you so much for the kind invitation, but I must decline, right? They don't have to express gratitude for this random invitation. Within the context of sexual invitations, you don't have to do that sort of repair work. Similarly, within the context of sexual invitations, you can back out at any time without having to offer a sufficient reason or without having to sort of make amends for backing out, right? If you were like, yeah, let's go back to your place and then decide, you know what? Not feeling it. Um, or maybe you don't feel comfortable or maybe you're like, you know what? I'm just kind of tired. I would rather take a nap. For whatever reason, you're allowed to back out of or decline sexual invitations with no residue. You don't have to, again, express gratitude or express regret. Now let's look at why invitations are so important within the context of sexual agency and sexual interactions. So within an ethical sexual encounter, Kukla argues, invitations are the primary way by which we initiate that sexual interaction. 
In order to see why it's so important that we have invitations as a tool here, let's first recall some of the alternative, far less ethical or agential ways of thinking about sexual interactions. So if we think back to the commodity model of sex, which remember is very, very gendered, um, under this model, women have the sex and men are trying to get the sex. Here, sexual interactions are thought of ooh, as something to which men are often entitled, so long as they do sort of the minimally decent things, they are entitled to sexual access to the women and women's bodies who they are sort of being minimally decent to. Consent is thought of as something like a contract. And if somebody revokes consent, then they are thought of as being in breach of a contract. Similarly, if a person, although under the commodity model, really a woman, um, says no to a sexual interaction even before it starts, she's often thought of as doing something wrong to, again, wildly gendered model, um, the guy that she is rejecting, right? So here, there's this very rigid and whew, constraining way of thinking about sexual interactions. It's not ideal. Okay, so in contrast, invitations give us an alternative way to think about how to negotiate and navigate sexual interactions, one which crucially centers everyone's agency. So first of all, invitations are fundamentally open. No one is ever entitled to have somebody else accept their invite. Instead, in order for it to be an invitation, it is necessary that everyone receiving the invite be able to either say yes or no to it. And we can use that in our daily lives when we might be thinking about asking someone out. We can use this kind of framework in order to look at whether or not a person genuinely can say no to an invitation without, oh, fear or risk of repercussions. And if they can't really say no to an invitation, then whatever you say is not going to be able to be an invitation, regardless of how nicely you frame it or what, if you, no matter how many times you say the word, I'm inviting you to do this. Um, it will not be an invitation if a per person can't genuinely say no. So, this can help us think about where and when it might be appropriate or possible to issue ethical sexual invitations. Even more than that, it can help us to think about, oh, other ways of navigating sexual interactions that we might find ourselves to be part of. So it is often the case that people find themselves within a sexual encounter or an interaction, maybe because they feel caught up in it, or because they don't know how to stop things, or how to extricate themselves from that interaction. Think about how much the commodity model of sex is at play in all of those thoughts. In contrast, if we understand invitations as a primary tool used to initiate sexual encounters, and if we actually start to practice this, then that builds in moments in which a person can think about what they want and genuinely can either accept or decline the sexual invitations they've received. Under our current framework, which so heavily relies on the commodity model, oh, the commodity model of sex or the contract model of consent, saying no is often framed as a bad thing as wronging the person who is being rejected. But if we change our mindset and instead th th start thinking about invitations as this primary tool within sexual interactions, then that fundamentally changes the dynamics here. So if you've been issued a sexual invitation, you're not wronging anyone by saying no. You're not denying anyone of something to which they're entitled. You're declining an invite, which by its very nature, is something you are properly able to either say yes or no to, right? And that changes what it feels like both to say yes and to say no, because then you genuinely get to say yes, which is far more of an exciting experience than to feel like you're sort of constrained into an encounter. Or you can genuinely say no without that sort of guilt that often goes along. 
Now, obviously, of course, people might still feel things like peer pressure or FOMO, and so uh, sort of feel funneled into saying yes to the sexual invitation. Once we start using invitations, it doesn't magically solve everything. But notice how different it is to, oh, say yes because of fear of missing out versus say yes because you think that if you say no, you'll be harming somebody else, that you'd be wronging somebody else. Those are importantly different kinds of interactions. Again, it shouldn't be the case that people are sort of um, pressured into or engaging in sexual interactions that they don't wish to be engaging in. But once we start using invitations, it can help to make it oh, more possible for people to either decline or to, you know what, change their minds and be like, not into this anymore um, within a sexual interaction without feeling oh, so constrained and so much like they are harming or wronging somebody by saying no. When we use invitations as one of our main tools for initiating sexual interactions, this sets up the encounter as one that is open. People can accept or decline at any time for any reason. In doing this, invitations centrally recognize the sexual agency of all participants, that everyone ought to have the effective ability to craft their own sexual narrative. Additionally, in order to be able to craft one's own sexual narrative, we need to have a means to express and explore sexual desires or fantasies that one might have, particularly if these desires or fantasies involve interacting with other people. Invitations are one such means. Invitations are a way to express interest in some kind of sexual activity or encounter, and to ask if the other person or persons might be interested in doing so as well. Without invitations, we have very few tools that we can use to collaboratively explore sexual desires. You could maybe make a statement or an assertion. You could say something like, I like bondage. And that can be an important way to express one's sexual desires. But there's nothing in that kind of speech act that specifically is directed at the other person or persons. Nor is it expressing any kind of hope or oh, sort of welcoming invitation um, that the other person or persons might like to explore those sexual desires with you. And if that kind of statement or assertion is the only real means we have to express sexual desires, that doesn't build in any sense of sexual interactions as a kind of collaborative activity. So one person might state their fantasy and then the other person or persons would either go along with it or leave. There's nothing positioning fantasies or desires as a thing to be explored together. Invitations give us a means by which to initiate collaborative sexual encounters. And even more than that, they give a way to voice and potentially explore sexual interests and desires. It's a way for one person to express what they're interested in, and for the person or persons receiving the invite to then express whether they would like to engage in that kind of fantasy or desire together. A given sexual encounter might involve lots of invites going back and forth, one person issuing one, another person issuing one, right? So it might be an ongoing series of invitations to pursue sexual interests together. And think about what that means. Everyone's expressed preferences are being given consideration here. Everyone is supported in shaping their sexual narrative. If we think that sexual agency is important, then people need to actually have tools to shape their sexual narrative and to pursue sexual desires that they might have. When those sexual desires involve other people, invitations are a crucial tool for doing that. So invitations are this kind of oh, centrally important discursive tool for good ethical sexual encounters.